energy is one of those things in science that can be hard to wrap your head around. Energy is the capacity to do work and to make something happen. It's different from matter because it has no mass and it takes up no space. You can really only detect it by its effect. Thermochemistry is the branch of chemistry that studies energy changes that occur during chemical reactions or changes of state. There are two main categories for the different forms of energy. Potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy describes a situation where work isn't currently being done, but it could be done under the right situation. Chemical energy is the energy that's stored in the bonds of atoms. The kinds of atoms and their arrangements will determine how much energy is stored. Kinetic energy is the form with action. Thermal energy is the internal energy of a substance, which we can't actually measure, but we can calculate the energy when the thermal energy moves. We call that heat. In this lesson, we're going to focus a little on chemical energy and largely on thermal energy and its transfer process called heat. Potential energy is stored in the bonds of this chemical, isooctane, also known as gasoline. When the bonds break, an explosion occurs, which turns the stored chemical energy into kinetic energy in the forms of both movement and heat. The explosion moves the pistons of the engine and thereby the car, and the heat will make the engine hot. Heat is energy that transfers from one object to another because of a temperature difference between them. Heat is represented by the letter Q. Heat always, always flows from the warmer object to the colder object. In the case of a cup of water with ice, the water is warmer than the ice, so the heat will flow from the water to the ice. When we talk about heat, we have to specify two things, our system or item that we're focusing on, and the surroundings with a defined limit. We have to bring things down from the size of the universe to something we can handle. This cat is alive and metabolizing the food that it ate, and it's giving off heat, which goes from the system to the surroundings. The cat is giving away its heat or losing its heat, so we say that the Q is negative. The Q of the surroundings is absorbing the heat that the cat is releasing, or gaining heat, so it's positive. The amount of heat released by the cat will be equal to the amount of heat absorbed by the surroundings, which is according to the law of conservation of energy. This fact will become important soon. Now the heat lost or gained could be the other way around, like this. The surroundings give off heat. Imagine the scenario of the ice cube. As it's starting to melt, the ice cube is the system, and the surroundings would include the air and the surface that the cube is on. This time, heat is leaving the surroundings and moving into the ice cube, which causes it to melt. Notice, it's not the cold that moves, it's always the heat that moves. This time the Q of the system is positive and the Q of the surroundings is negative. This time the Q of the system is positive and the Q of the surroundings is negative. The examples with the cat and the ice cube are great examples of exothermic and endothermic processes. The cat releases heat into the surroundings, so this is exothermic, which literally translates to out heat. The ice cube, however, absorbs heat from the surroundings, so this is endothermic, which means in heat. Endothermic systems have a positive Q, and exothermic systems have a negative Q. Now it's important to note that heat and temperature are not actually the same thing. Even though we may use the words interchangeably in everyday conversation, heat is the transfer of thermal energy, whereas temperature is the average kinetic energy of a sample of particles. You can't directly measure heat. We don't have heat ohmmeters. It's just too complicated to calculate every possible source of heat energy in an object, kind of like trying to precisely measure the volume of the ocean. It's just not going to happen. But we can measure temperature with thermometers. The main unit of measurement for heat is the joule or calorie, and for temperature it's Celsius or Kelvin. They really only have one thing in common, and that's that you can use temperature as part of a calculation to find heat. Heat is measured in joules or calories. One joule is the amount of energy to raise one gram of water, 0 0.2390 degrees Celsius. But in food science, we use calories to measure energy. 4.184 joules makes up one calorie with a lowercase c. Interestingly, to raise one gram of water one whole degree Celsius, it takes 4.184 joules. The calorie is based on this information. Now, be careful when you read food labels, because you're actually reading a kilocalorie, which is written with a capital letter C. It's a subtlety, but one that's important for us to point out. Every object can be heated up. 
The amount of heat needed to increase the temperature of an object by exactly one degree Celsius is called heat capacity. Different objects will have different heat capacities based on their mass and chemical composition. So to really account for the mass, we need to use something else called specific heat capacity. This is the amount of heat it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of the substance one degree Celsius. Specific heat capacity is written as a letter C, and it has units of joules per gram degree Celsius. Here are some common substances and their specific heat capacities. Water has a very high capacity compared to metals like iron. This means that it will require more heat to raise the temperature of water than it does to raise the temperature of iron. This makes sense if you've ever boiled water in an iron pot. Even though the pot will be too hot to touch, the water may only be lukewarm. Let's try calculating specific heat of a substance. 11.7 grams of aluminum increases temperature from 12 degrees Celsius to 24.5 degrees Celsius with the addition of 132 joules of heat. What's the specific heat? Now, specific heat is equal to the heat divided by mass and change in temperature. So we can plug in our data, making sure to subtract the initial temperature from the final temperature. And we'll get C is equal to 0 0.90 joules per gram degrees Celsius for aluminum. Thanks for watching this episode of Teacher's Pet. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter at SciencePet.